black mental health. And somebody might say, why do we have to talk about racism? And what does that got to do with any kind of mental health or even black mental health? But I say that there is no more important topic than the topic of racism, not just for Atlanta, not just for the area of the world that we call the United States. But racism is a dynamic that impacts the entire world. The known universe as we know it here. And racism is the dominant dynamic on this planet. And if we do not understand racism, I might as well quote Mr. Neely Fuller who says that if you do not understand racism, meaning white supremacy, then everything else that you think you understand will only confuse you. I'll say that again. If you don't understand racism meaning white supremacy, and I think Mr. Fuller says what it is and exactly how it works, everything else that you think you understand will only confuse you. And I will follow up by focusing on how we have become accustomed to greeting each other. We have become accustomed to bringing each other within the framework of this dynamic of racism. We as black people, as people of African heritage, we greet each other by saying, hey, what's happening? And I maintain that our biggest problem has been that we really didn't understand it. So we say what is happening mean we didn't really understand what racism was all about. And I see us moving in this final decade of the 20th century into the 21st century with an increased knowledge and understanding very, very, very specifically of racism and I do believe that with that understanding, we will be able to answer the question of what's happening and bring into being everything that we have envisioned and everything that our ancestors envisioned. It will be because we take our understanding to that level. Now, I read an article, I tried to buy a lot of newspapers, and I picked up the Washington Post on the plane. Somebody's old Washington Post for a day. And I saw an article, a big article in the religious section of the paper. And it was talking about the United Methodist, the Church of Christ, I believe. And they are going to get into a study of racism. And one of the persons within that denomination was talking in this article about how people try to avoid the discussion of racism, try not to get into it. Or like sometimes people say to me, Dr. Wilson, you're still talking about that racism. <laughs> because I've been doing it for what, 20 years? Right. But this is good if they will get into it deeply, not just try to get black people and white people to love each other. We've been through that phase. <laughs> it has to be taken to another level where white people will get into a discussion of white supremacy and black people will get into a discussion of white supremacy and if there are white people who are interested in justice, then they will talk about the elimination of white supremacy. And black people will certainly know that it is their business. It is our mission on this planet to bring justice. It's just like the mission of parents is to see that the house is run well. And 
and that the children are developed in that house. Well, the great creator made black people the mothers and fathers of everybody on this planet. And so we have been taken away from that role of authority and leadership. And the planet is in total and complete chaos. Witness what is going on currently. You see, where people are spending multiple billions of dollars trying to create a war. For at the same time they say that there's not enough money for housing. They can't do anything about the problem of homelessness. They can't do anything about the problem of employment or unemployment. They can't do anything about the problem of children having inadequate educational institutions to go to. But multiple billions, I didn't say million, I said billions, to spend on the destruction of life. Now, if we needed any more proof, I don't know what it is, that things are turned completely upside down. And they are everything other than what it is that they are supposed to be. And this is where we hit the stage. As I said, God made us the mothers and fathers of all of the people on the planet from crystal black to white. And it is our responsibility to see that justice is returned to the entire planet and that all of the planet's people and children are walking in dignity and are highly, highly, highly developed. And then I guess we can go on out to outer galaxies and make certain everything is going on all right there. <laughs> But here we are with this very great problem in front of us that many people do not want to look at. But we are going to pull up all of the courage that we have. And we're going to ask the Creator in Africa, please bring to our attention everything that was bestowed upon us. And let us use this very great inheritance and endowment use all of these talents to increase our understanding and to correct this problem. So now what is racism? And I talk the same thing over and over again when I'm talking to black people. Somebody said, well, do you say the same thing to white people they asked me that today? And I said, the exact same thing. And I follow what my father said. He used to say to my father, Dad, why do you say the same thing over and over again? And he said, repetition has its virtue. And here I am at my age saying the same thing that he said. So we're going to go over this again for people who have heard it before and for people who have not heard it. What is racism? In 1967, I met a gentleman named Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. in the District of Columbia. I was a psychiatrist, having completed training in general psychiatry, and I was doing a fellowship in child psychiatry. And I knew that I had to understand racism if I was going to help black people get well. We were trained under a Freudian psychoanalytic theory, and my brain computer said, even though I had to learn what they were saying, my brain computer said, that does not compute. <laughs> and even if I tried to use it to help white people or black people, they would look at me as though I was the one in need of care. <laughs> so I knew that there were other answers to be found, and I was in pursuit of finding those answers, meaning turn the computer on, help me find. And so indeed, in 1967, I met Mr. Neely Fuller at a social event. It was a party, people sitting around talking about different ideas. 
And this man way over in the other corner of the room said, racism is a global system of behavior that people who classify themselves as white have organized so as to maintain control and domination over the people that they classify as not white. And my brain computer over in this corner heard him over there. I really didn't know him. And my brain computer said, that's it. And so I wanted to talk to him more and find out what was it that he understood. And Neely Fuller, let me go to this blackboard. Because they say one picture is worth a thousand words, so the people in the back can't quite see, the people in the front will tell you later what I put on the board. <laughs> but essentially, Mr. Fuller said it was a system. See, now one thing in this article that I looked at in the newspaper this morning, they were talking about institutional, how many people have heard institutional racism? Well, Neely Fuller said, no, it's above and beyond that because institutions are lower in organization than a system. And so he said that it was a system, not only was it a local system, that it was global worldwide. Wherever there were people of color and wherever there were people who classified themselves as white encountering those people of color. And he said this system functions in all areas of people activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. Now that's everything. See, you can get everything that you want to think about under one of these areas of activity. I could put medicine under education, I could put it under labor, I could put it under law. Depending, I can deal with sex and the medicine, okay? So, everything that we think about can come under one of these nine areas of people activity. And so, when I heard him say that, and that he said it was global. I said, this is a fascinating idea, but why would the people who classify themselves as white, why would they think to do it? See, in little children, this is where you can study little children and become wise. What do they say, a little child shall leave them? Okay. Like I talked to a child in my office and I said, sweetheart, I don't want you to be sad. I want you to feel good and be happy. And an 11-year-old child said to me this week, I don't want to be happy. I want to be serious. <laughs> you see, heavy. <laughs> and I said, you are right, sweetheart. <laughs> Maybe that little boy IQ 175, right? <laughs> But little children know to raise the question, why, right? Why, Daddy? Why, Mommy? Why, why? Until you get tired of hearing it. But the child in its wisdom knows that that is the key to turning on the brain computer. So I said, why? Okay, if this is a system racism, the R word, Racism meaning white supremacy. It's global, it encompasses everything, but why? And I remember Mr. Fuller said, Francis, well, you don't wait, you don't really need to understand why. Just understand how this system works. But you know ladies have their own way to go, right? <laughs> so I said, no, I gotta understand why. Because if I can get down in the nitty gritty and understand why they do it. That'll put us even further ahead of the game, I believe, in solving this problem. So I put that question in my brain computer. I didn't go into a big laboratory. I didn't go and start developing some statistical data and struggling with chi-square. 
I just told my laboratory brain computer, work on the question. What does it say? Asking, it shall be open. Asking it shall be given, or knocking it shall, that's what this question is. Why? Knocking. So I was really in my kitchen doing dishes or cooking. This is like months later, still struggling with this answer or working with it. And all of a sudden, the brain computer came out with the printout. <coughs> Patience, wait on the Lord, right? <laughs> so what came out of my computer was this, that we are on this planet Earth, one-tenth, if not fewer, of the people are white. <coughs> Nine-tenths of the people, the vast majority, are black, brown, red, and yellow. The one-tenth keep talking about the genetic inferiority of the nine-tenths. See, read the newspaper, people. All the material comes in the newspaper because earlier this week, <coughs> I don't know if you read it in your newspaper here. They reported on a research project done at the University of Chicago where they found out that the majority of white people have negative attitudes about black and others. I could have told them right <laughs> was that the majority of white people think black people want to be on welfare, don't want to work, are lazy, and inferior to white people in terms of intelligence. This is 1991. And so I knew that back in the late 60s. So when my brain computer said, well now these are the demographics on the planet, and the fact that the tiny minority that classifies itself as white and all these other people as non-white, the majority that is referred to as minorities, okay, <laughs> that this minority is calling this majority genetically inferior. And so then my brain computer said, but wait. White means genetic recessive. And black, brown, red, and yellow means genetically dominant. And I said, I got it. It's as simple as that. And I wrote the press theory. It turned out to be 13 little pages. Not 487 pages in an index, no, 13 pages. <laughs> Very basic, like Einstein said, really nature is straightforward in the final analysis, not all that complex. Very straightforward and very beautiful. I said, oh, they're talking about our genetics, that something is wrong with our genetics. But it's their genetics that are recessive. That's right. That we are genetically dominant, and the fact that we are the vast majority of the people on the planet, after they had circumnavigated the globe starting where in the 15th century, and every place they landed, they found colored people. <laughs> And the men, to be sure, the white men had sexual contact with these women of color. And if they stayed around nine months, they found out that all the children looked like their mothers. And they concluded quickly 
that they could be genetically annihilated. And really, I think that they found that out much, much longer ago. In the days of Greece and Rome and the Roman Empire, because they were interacting across the Mediterranean with those black people in Africa. And they found that all of those black people were genetically dominant in turn people color. And then when they traveled all over the world beyond the Mediterranean, they said, we have got a serious problem. <laughs> That what if these people who are all over this planet, various shades of black, what if those men decided to get in boats and go up here to the area called Europe? You know, we're in the area of the world right now where they used to talk about mongrelization of the races. Didn't they talk about that in this country? Is this Georgia? <laughs> What were they talking about? The fact that black people could cause the entire population of white people to become black. And so they thought to themselves, I'm sure, why we don't want to disappear. See, that can be in a children's book. They sailed in little boats, boys and girls. <coughs> And they found all of these beautiful people of color everywhere who were very, very powerful. And they could cause the white people to turn black. And they said, oh my, we don't want that. <laughs> <laughs> and so they said, well, we will have to work out a means, a methodology to prevent that from happening. So what we must do is to go all over all the world and dominate and control the people of color in all areas of activity. And then we can prevent white genetic annihilation. And we can ensure white genetic Survival. Are you with me? <laughs> this is a workshop, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? But we didn't understand it. And we have not understood it because under white supremacy they taught us to hate black color and we were struggling to get rid of it. And it was so powerful we couldn't get rid of it. So we weren't thinking that it was some people that were afraid of being genetically or not. So we were trying to get to the point where we could be genetically or not. <laughs> Don't marry anybody darker than yourself. Has everybody heard that? I know this is an advanced class. <laughs> So I thought about that, and then beyond that, the people were doing a very interesting thing as they taught us, if you're black, stay black, brown, stick around, yellow, mellow, white, right? Did everybody here learn that? I don't want you to fail white supremacy. <laughs> See, everybody, all people of color, I lectured in London. You think that the black people sitting over there in London? No black stay man brown stick around yellow now you better believe they know. Do they know it in Brazil? Yes, they know it. Do they know it in Mexico? Yes, they know it. I was a college student and went to Mexico in 1954. And the people there were talking, the Indian people were talking about they don't let any Indian, meaning not the highly miscegenated. <laughs> almost white, but the darker people could never be Miss Mexico. So all over the world, do you think in Asia they know it? You think in Saudi Arabia they know it? Yes. <laughs> Everywhere that people who classify themselves as white have taught their survival necessity 
If you're black, stay black, brown, stick around, yellow, no, white, right. These are all really like the same color except white. Because these are varying levels of the genetic ability to produce melanin skin pigment. It's a black pigment. If you have a whole lot of it, you're crystal black. A little bit less, you look brown. A little bit less, we put in your red. A little bit less yellow. Almost not at all white. So while they were teaching us that these colors and the genetic capacity to produce them was really a horrible thing, on the other side of the track, they were doing something real sneaky. And I come from the south side of Chicago, the ghetto in Chicago, and grew up, I never saw large, I never saw, I don't think before I was 16 years old, I didn't think I ever saw white people taking their clothes off trying to get a tank. <laughs> Until I went to college, and I was the only black girl in my class at Antioch College back in the early 50s. When I got there, they used to say, Francis, do you know Corey? <laughs> She had been there years before. <laughs> it was correct stuff. She had been the one black girl in some class <laughs> before I got there. I mean, it just turned out interesting history, okay? <laughs> but here I am, the first spring after going to college in the fall. And I was in culture shock for many reasons. But I came back, it was an April day, and the sun was bright. And I came back from the cafeteria, and these bodies were all over the lawn. I'm cold, right? <laughs> like, I was freezing in the hotel, but I figured out they had to come up and show me how to turn on the heat. Okay. See, Africa, we want heat. <laughs> But I came back and here are all these bodies and I actually stood on the wall, really in culture shock. And I'm looking at these people. And then it may have taken me about, I hope it didn't take five minutes. <laughs> but then I, oh, they're trying to get something? Do you understand what I'm saying? And then after the year got into the summer and then they would say, see, Francis? Now I'm your color. <laughs> and I really couldn't figure that out in the 50s. And I couldn't figure it out until the late 60s. That while they were telling us we were ugly, you see, but at that same institution of learning in that college, where I came home in tears one time, why did you send me here? You know, I was in the days when your parents sent you where they wanted you to go. And my mother said to me, there are some places, how did she put it, like there, there are only some places where you can get certain things. And somehow I stopped crying. And what she was telling me, friends, is you're on a mission and you have to go and find out what these people are about. <laughs> And so I realized, because I would be standing in the shower, you know, the group shower and the girls don't, and they would be looking, oh, look at Francis's car. I didn't understand, I've been brought up on this. Black stay back, brown stick around, and here they are admiring black. When we were trying to get rid of it, they were trying to produce it. And even when the physicians and the dermatologists said to them, don't go out in the sun like that, you'll get cancer. Time Magazine reported several years ago when they did an article on the sun tanning harvest that one white person was informed that if they went to the suntan parlor on a regular basis, they would get skin cancer, and the person said, I don't care, at least I'll be a good-looking corpse. <laughs> <laughs> now, they had us over here calling each other blackie and all kind of names, 
and causing disruption in families about who's the darkest and who's the lightest. And you, do you all know all of that? History. Our past history, right? Not, certainly not our present history. <laughs> but anyway, we were being taken through all of those changes. And we simply didn't understand that a major envy game was going on. And I wrote about it and talked about it. I was teaching at Howard University College of Medicine and there came a time I was ready to receive promotion and tenure after teaching there seven years. And I heard over the grapevine, no, you're not going to get promotion and tenure. I went right into the dean. Could this be true? <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> and I said, why? <laughs> and he said, that paper that you wrote, I only written the one paper to press there. Well, what's the matter with it? It doesn't make sense for you to say or imply that white people are envious of black people's color. And I said, but I've got letters from them from all over the world. It <laughs> was true. Because when the white people saw me on television talking about it, a lot of white people wrote and said, you're right, I always wished I had come. <laughs> now imagine if we knew that a hundred years ago. <laughs> Do you think I would have to stand here talking about that? See, mental health is predicated on how much do you love yourself? And how much do you love the reflection of yourself, meaning all the other colored people? See, I'd be out of a job. But no, they taught us the reverse. So that was why we're saying, well, what's happening? What's happening? I hate black and they're suntanning. What's happening? So I put that together. And all other kinds of things started falling in place. Like my grandmother used to say when she was teaching us how little children making puzzles, we're five years old, oh, it's too many pieces, we can't possibly. <laughs> my grandmother would say, relax. And put all the straight edge pieces over here on this side of the table. She was saying, Francis, establish the context. Once you establish context, everything else you can put in place. If you never establish context, then you are into nonsense. <laughs> See, I'm going to tell you about why we don't look like we do too well academically. Because everybody who takes the IQ test and understands, they understand white supremacy. That's their system. And they understand what is what and what is what. And they didn't teach us that. So we're stumbling around and our brain computer is not making logic. I'm telling you, line up and understand the white supremacy, you watch your IQ jump up to 275 overnight. <laughs> so what did I start understanding? Because I had asked the question when I was a very young child, why? I asked my grandmother again. They were talking about a black man having been lynched. It was reported in the black newspaper in Chicago, so my parents and grandmother standing around talking in hushed tones. So the child who's not supposed to be in on the discussion, well, why would they do it? And my grandmother said, well, some people just have to act ugly. And it wasn't until the 70s that I put it together after having put this together. Oh, I know why they had to lynch and castrate black men. Why, it's perfectly logical. If they are concerned about genetic survival, castration is an attack on the male genitalia and specifically on the testicles. 
right? Are you all into this? Yeah. Everybody does know what this is.